Welcome to the Race Mastery Guide for the Dark Elves, where today we will quickly and concisely run through the race, simplify, then run through how to dominate on Legendary without any cheese or exploits, though we'll be exploring some of these too. Long ago, Anarion cast himself into the Sacred Flames and arose as the first Phoenix King with the power to save Ulthwan from chaos. When his eldest son Malekith was denied his rightful succession, the resulting civil war culminated in Ulthwan's devastation and the usurpers being exiled to the northwest lands of Chill, where a new society was built on the backs of the oppressed. The Dark Elves are centered around the northwest capital of Nagarond, where they dominate their enemies and each other before they realize their grand ambition, finally conquering Ulthwan from the High Elves. They are just as powerful as their do-gooder counterparts, but they require a notable degree more skill to use optimally. While the High Elves can sit back and shoot arrows from behind their shields while their passive trade makes them rich, the Dark Elves must adopt a more dynamic battlefield style while diligently managing their economy of unwilling workers. First, let's have a look at the racial strengths. The Dark Elf slave economy, if managed correctly, is arguably the best in the game. Many elements influence it, so just bear with me here and understand for now more captors in battle means more workers to generate you wealth. Another iconic strength is the Dark Elf Blackhawks, which grant unrivaled naval supremacy and recruiting power. On the battlefield, their signature crossbows, even at low tier, have incredible armor piercing potential, but this does cost at the cost of range, but fortunately, this can be overcome by some of the amazing special offensive abilities on several of their units to help them overcome their innate lack of strength by making up for it with viciousness and arrogant determination. And this is in addition to their staple murderous prowess, which is triggered when the accumulated deaths on both sides trigger an army-wide buff to arrow damage and melee attack. Late game, the Dark Elves have some great monster options. And finally, magic of course is incredibly powerful. They have access to fire and shadow, but they miss out on the Lord of Life. So their only reliable means of healing is through their unique lore of dark magic. But like the High Elf lore, it's only really good on the legendary lords. And now for the weaknesses, starting with the glaring fact you could easily confuse the Elven soldiery for a very well-groomed accounting department. Yes, Elves are physically weak, not dealing much damage or being able to take a hit either, and the High Elves overcome this through having elite equipment and training. But since discipline is for nerds, the Dark Elves use their vicious offensive abilities to decisively overwhelm the opponent. But just be aware, when that charge bonus finally wears off, reality will come crashing down. This makes Dark Elves the polar opposite to the High Elves by having good offensive options, but in the absence of any martial prowess or anything to boost their defense, they are very weak in defensive infantry. And while their basic spearman is shielded and very serviceable, they lack the discipline that makes the High Elf spearmen great. Moreover, they lack mid and high tier defensive options. As you go up the tiers, you are more likely to find Dark Elves drop their shield for a second blade, which helps with counter charging but leaves you without that quintessential shielded line holder. Fortunately, you have some good flanking options which will help you overcome this and the fact they have poor artillery options. Off the battlefield, while they do lose some potency when away from water, no Dark Elf faction is really that starved of naval opportunity. And something to always consider is Dark Elves are an ambitious bunch of backstabbers. Confederations can be needlessly hard and you'll have to watch out that your generals don't betray you. Overall, the Dark Elves do have weaknesses, but they can be negated if you use the right combination of tools correctly. There are six legendary lords to choose from and in stereotypical elf faction, the Dark Elves form an army of uppity nerds led by some absolute powerhouse characters. From the capital of Nagaron, they are led by Malekith, dubbed the Witch King after failing to read the instructions of the Sacred Flames and incinerating himself. He's set on claiming the rightful throne in Ulthwan and is a contender for the most powerful character in the entire game and a recommended first Dark Elf campaign for anyone. Neighboring Malekith is the Hag Queen, Crone Hellebron, a devout disciple and bride of Cain, looking to fill her blood cauldron to preserve her cursed beauty. Marathi is Malekith's mother and their most powerful caster. 
corrupted by the hedonistic elven temptations, and despite her magical ability, her faction has a notoriously difficult task of managing the needs of her kingdom, as well as the corruption her pleasure cults create. Much further south is Lockheed Felhart. The Kraken Lord of the Dark Elf Navy, he is their greatest general boasting unmatched naval supremacy and a deadly duelist to boot. Rakath is an enslaver of mighty monsters and ventures out recruiting beasts from wild wolves to mighty mammoths and dragons. There is no beast he cannot break to his will and he is fittingly voiced by Ramsay Bolton. And finally, my personal favourite, Malice Darkblade, a great warrior on a slaving expedition with a literal demon speaking in his ear which is kept in check thanks to Malekith's intervention. Whether you start around Nagarond or far away, you will want to secure the Northwest at some point. Both Malekith and Crone start here and will have the goal of clearing the northwest corner of the map, so simply conquer the minor factions around here, with the exception of the very top province, held by Mung. This is literally, hands down, the worst province in the entire game. It will endlessly revolt due to corruption, make zero money, cannot build walls, and your endless efforts to make this dumpster province work will be burnt to the ground by chaos when they arrive. Either maintain non-aggression and trade with Mung, or just raise these settlements to the ground because your armies should be expanding into the great surrounding settlements rather than babysitting this dumpster. While most Dark Elf factions will hate you, that's because that's what Dark Elves do, but they typically won't attack you. Just make sure you don't appear weak by having too many wars and make sure you keep a healthy balance of power with a good military. And for this reason, it's good to simply leave the Deadwood Sentinels and the Forge Band alive as they provide valuable buffer states and you can either confederate them later or forcefully acquire their holdings when you're ready. This is because the lands directly south are of greater immediate value and here you will find Clark Rond arguably the most important Dark Elf faction as confederating them will allow you to make long distance relations with Marathi. But getting them is also important because if another major faction confederates them, it can severely obstruct your expansion. So if you want an easy time, you can restart your campaign until Clark Arond roll the underdog trait, making them very, very easy to confederate. Otherwise, if they roll the supremacy trait, it's usually impossible to confederate in the short term and you should probably just attack them when you're ready. In this territory, you'll encounter several beastmen tribes and quite simply, avoid war until you are positioned to eliminate them in a single turn. Their ability to underway poses a huge risk to your undefended minor settlements, so make sure you hunt them down and wipe them quickly. Both Rakath and Crone Hellebron are very easy to confederate with the underdog trait, so there is no need to rush this and it's often more efficient to let them establish and build up their starting provinces first. Though consider getting Rakath before turn 20, because after this he starts to expand into the old world and you're no more popular there and you might want to avoid the press. No surprise, Malekith himself is the hardest to confederate and can take hundreds of thousands of gold to join even with a huge strength advantage. Uh, Marathi is slightly easier, but only likely to confederate when she herself is wounded or threatened. So each turn, check your diplomacy screen and offer gold just to test for confederations because these two are opportunistic. Try to invite them into as many close by wars as possible to keep the heat on them and this will up your chances because when you do, Marathi's Titan Peaks are a rich and excellent southern border. Once you remove Nagareth, this provides an ideal springboard into Ulthuan. Just remember, a Lithana is very dangerous, so always scout ahead and use Ambush Stance. From here, it's actually up to you on whether you expand further south or not, because the Ulthuan invasion will be your prerogative and it is well worth the reward. In the meantime, make sure you send an agent down to make relations with Lockyer before he gets wiped out. He's pretty easy to confederate, but on the literal opposite end of the map, Malice Darkblade tends to sit quite safely and a military alliance with him is often beneficial because it will build strong relations and he doesn't really get in many wars. Again, just check that confederation screen, wait for him to lose a battle, and he will come running. Confederating Malekith will give you eyes on Malice Darkblade, so you don't need to send a scout there. And now that big corrupted elephant in the room, the Chaos Invasion, and yes it comes from the north and you are the buffer to it, so it's actually not as bad as it sounds. 
It always spawns at these five preset locations no earlier than turn 90. When you reach this turn or see the Chaos Stirs warning, then make sure you have some army stationed in the north and all of your minor provinces built up to tier 3 walls to slow their advance. Manually fight all of your battles so you can destroy the artillery to slow them. The second and final invasion occurs sometime after turn 140, but if you follow this guide, you should have plenty of armies ready to welcome them and stuff them into pens. Now it's time to run through the building and unit options, which I'll do in my usual format, starting at tier 1 to tell the story of your campaign's progression, starting with settlement buildings. The public order building should be built at every provincial capital and you should avoid it in minor provinces but it might be necessary even if only temporarily in some cases. At tier 1, you're going to be investing in growth and industry but you'll need a barracks in at least one province to recruit Dark Shards, the unit that will carry your early game. As a loose rule, hire three Dark Shards for every Spearman or Hero to guard the front line. See my formations video for more. Black Art Corsairs with Hambos are an expensive hybrid unit which don't do either role more efficiently, so you don't want them spammed in your main armies, but they don't require a barracks and can be hired in range of any port or Black Ark, making them an excellent crisis unit to raise quickly. We'll talk about Black Arcs in just a minute, but essentially those are your recruitment hubs and you should never build military buildings in your settlements as the Dark Elves. The only military building you should ever build in a province is the barracks because at level 2 it allows you to recruit an extra master, one of the Dark Elves best heroes. While you will need a few of these, don't go overboard and build barracks in place of good tradables or economic options because you don't actually need that many in the early game. On the battlefield, maximize their melee defense and armor and watch them hold as an amazing line holding unit which of course is quite rare for the Dark Elves. Avoid their mount options because the Flying Pegasus is great for casters, it's squishy and your master provides much more value on the ground guarding your short range crossbows. Masters are also pivotal for the slave economy but we'll get to that soon. A tier 3 barracks unlocks the bolt thrower which is quite useful for providing a long range option as well as the Dark Shards with Shield. And given that you're generally outranged in the early game, this is a great way of closing the distance and Shielded Dark Shards provide a great hard counter against the Lithanar's Shadow Warrior spam. For the Dark Elves, Tier 3 is the power tier. And by this point, you want to be investing in either a Sorceress Abode or a Shrine of Cain unless you have better economic options. And certainly by Tier 5, you absolutely want both of these structures. The Sorceress Abode grants an extra Sorceress and boosts research. And yes, a fire sorceress on a flying pegasus is an agile army killer and should be present in every single army. Keep her on a horse on the early levels and she'll wreck most armies before they get close. Any excess sorceress can acquire the knowledgeable trait to boost your faction wide winds of magic. The Shrine of Cain is an excellent building. Firstly, it decreases corruption, which is ever present in the lands of Chill. But moreover, this structure, only at tier 3, gives you an increased cap for two heroes. Firstly, the Death Hag is an offensive melee hero, and we really needed a line holder, but she can do okay. Just hammer those defensive stats and she can throw down while replenishing your forces, but off the battlefield she can scout and reduce corruption. But the best reason to carry a Master and Death Hag in your main army is because of the chance to gain followers anytime you level up. The Shrine of Cain also provides an additional Cain Knight Assassin, a hybrid melee crossbow user and he's really not that great at either, but they are invaluable to the economy. But before we get to that, the Dark Elves aren't just great at making money, they're also great at saving it thanks to their navy of black arcs. Dark Elves can't recruit globally like the other races, but instead they rely on Black Arcs, if within its ring of influence. Each Black Arc functions like a horde with its own individual growth and structures to spend it on. However, they can reach Tier 5 much quicker than settlements, therefore allowing them to access Tier 5 units tens of turns earlier than other races. However, the main reason to rush your Black Arcs to Tier 5 is because it speeds up your recruitment, maxing out at 7 units per turn. This ability to quickly raise armies of quality units is what makes the Dark Elves unmatched on the sea and so devastating along the coastline. But the underlying power of each Black Arc is how it reduces the upkeep for the onboard units by 50%. 
So yes, you can instantly halve all of your upkeep by hot potatoing your units into black arcs. In addition to this, a black arc does not count as a lord. So there are no supply lines attached to this army, making them very good on the harder difficulties. Every 25 turns, just use the sacrifice to Mathland right and you'll be able to gain another Black Hark, which you should always recruit and park into a port so it can level up over time. Offensively, Black Arcs can attack port settlements and can even be reinforced by a land army, but defensively is where the subtle power of them truly lies. There are several coastal settlements with a port capital, and given your policy of cruel oppression, revolts are simply a way of dark elf life. However, revolts always spawn at the capital. So by having a black arc parked at said capital with a basic army, you have a discount means of swatting down revolts to provide money, experience, and workers for your empire. So if we're recruiting almost exclusively from Black Arcs, which buildings are essential? Well, aside from power leveling the main building, a barracks can be nice, but a shade building is absolutely essential. For the mid to late game, the shades are the signature unit for the race. Uh, they're not as powerful as Sisters of Avalon straight out of the box, but they can sport Vanguard Deployment and Shroud, and can even hold decently in melee. But after the research, hit and run, and rework crossbows, they can actually outrange Sisters of Avalon, and they start to come into their own. So just keep that in mind that they're not an instant replacement for Dark Shards due to these upgrades and their price. However, they do come in a basic version for Tier 2, but once you can afford it, the Tier 3 Dual Weapons version is much better. There's a great weapons version, but takes two turns to recruit. However, if you do have the time, having two to four in your ranks can be handy on the flanks. To support them, a pair of Dark Riders with crossbows or warlocks can make respectable cavalry support, but you should never build the stable and simply acquire these opportunistically from a conquest. Your Black Arc growth points are much better spent on the monster building line, which at tier four unlocks the Hydra, and at tier five, the Black Dragon two of the best units in the entire roster. Adding just one or two of these in a single army can really improve its punch. Other than the essential shades and monster line, the Black Arc can also build additional bombardment abilities. Yes, that's right, you can support any army in the Black Arc's reach of influence, which will allow you extra bombardment attacks to use in battle. Also, the holding pens will increase the captives they receive. Most importantly, any army can recruit from a Black Arc as long as you are within its range. Just make sure you move the Black Arc before recruiting from a nearby army as the Black Ark does need to adopt in camp stands to do this. This is also a great time to check for any building upgrades. Each Black Ark has an Admiral who has his own skill tree. Make sure you get plus 10% research at level 10. When you confederate a faction, you also inherit all of their Black Arcs, so this can really help spike up your research rate. Now it's finally time to discuss the Slave Economy, where the backbone is you want as many captives as possible after every battle, therefore your first research should always be continuous slave supply, and every Lord should aim to get 3 points in Dreaded Slaver to make the most of each battle. As the Dark Elves, you'll always want to be fighting, so revolts actually make a key role in their playstyle, especially in the early game. It's recommended that you fight each battle manually and try to ensure 20% of it survives, so you can either get an extra battle that turn or spare it and then have another fight the following turn. Just remember Skaven have the largest army numbers, therefore providing the most captives, making them the employer's choice. While you nearly always want to take the captives after every battle, occasionally you'll find that the captives and ransom are minuscule, so in this case execute for a 5% chance to get the best follower in the game. You can also get these when you occupy and raise settlements, though if you're looking to expand quickly, loot and occupy can be an optimal mix of increasing your workers whilst only stripping one level from the province. Alternatively sacking provides the most wealth and devastation, but also a 30% chance to get the fantastic high elf slave follower. You'll also want the broken by the lash research to try and get overseer and because so many great followers come as a result of either leveling up or defeating enemies, this is reason enough to try and carry at least a death hag and master in each of your major armies. So all these captives, where do they go? Well there's only place we want them to go and that is a single province and we're going to call that our worker province. Your worker province should request extra slaves followed here on this button and you can see overhead that we want to block slaves going to any other province. The requirement for a worker province is four settlements to house the most workers, then multiplied by the most number of buildings. Nagaron's home, the Iron Mountains, 
and Marathi's Titan Peaks are both excellent contenders. The rules to settlement design apply the same before, but a higher priority above anything else is the slave buildings, i.e. the slave pen in every settlement and the black roads if you can fit it. Just ensure you have strong economic buildings as slave revenue is a factor of the base revenue of the province. The first challenge of an unwilling workforce is public order, but since you chose a port capital, a black arc is parked there waiting to stuff them back into their offices. So that's that challenge essentially negated. But the other one is decline. Yes, that's right, due to the dangers of being worked to death, as your workforce grows near capacity, employee mortality increases. So therefore you'll need to keep on winning more battles to keep that constant flow up. Globally, you can fight this with Malekith's motivation through fear, lowering it by 10%, while the trader's palace at Karankar lowers it by another 5 The life of Dread Research lowers it by an additional 15%, so that's 30% globally, but can we get it to zero? And the answer is yes. A tier 4 slave pen in your capital will reduce decline by 50, so now we're at 80%, and the difference can be made up by masters, namely their level 6 psychophantic schema trait. Each master with this skill in the province cumulatively reduces decline by 10%. Masters in a province should also prioritize their stimulate growth ability. Out in the fields of battle, every time you do earn a desirable follower, make sure you unequip it and then re-equip it onto one of your heroes stationed inside the worker province. So if each worker earns a set amount, can we increase this rate? Well, yes we can, and we do so thanks to assassins. Nothing motivates you more than the shadow of death lurking behind you, and assassins up to level 10 can increase the amount of income per head by up to 10%. And yes, this does stack for every assassin you have there, so this is the most profitable use for your assassins. See my following Dark Elf Heroes video on how to best level and utilize these heroes. Although it takes a long time for one worker's province to fill, it eventually will, and you'll need to find a new four settlement province. But are we done compounding the revenue of workers' provinces? Well, not quite. We have one more trick, and it comes from our non-legendary lords. Speaking of which, unless you're role-playing, it's a one-horse race. A sorceress's magic can outpace any of the other options. She has all the best skills, including a black dragon mount, which completely circumvents her weakness in melee. Regardless, at level 10, any lord can unlock the name of power skill, where you get to choose a random trait that buffs either the character, their army, or the entire faction. You can only choose from one of these categories, but when you do, there are only six for each, so you have a one in six of getting the one you want and four are always good, but if you can hire a lord at level 10, that means you can keep on disbanding until you find the traits you want, namely the army-wide crossbow buffs like Barb Storm or Shadow Dart to boost shade range by another 35%, but moreover, since faction traits remain active even after the lord is disbanded, you can keep on hiring level 10 lords en masse and selecting the aristocratic names of power, i.e. the faction-wide buffs, and by disbanding enough of these, a good number will have the economic buffs, which of course stack on top of your burgeoning slave economy. And yes, this is completely broken and unnecessary, but here's the option should you choose to use it. Non-legendary lords also have the loyalty mechanic, which can be increased up to 10 through that lord winning battles, recruiting new units, at which point you'll be rewarded with powerful items. And conversely, if their army barely wins close victories or has units taken away, their loyalty will decrease until it hits zero, at which point they revolt. Honestly, if you keep an eye on loyalty, it shouldn't be a problem. If you need to disband a problematic lord with low loyalty, you can either get them deliberately killed in battle, or just have a nearby army there to crush them. And this highlights how the mechanic can be abused to create a pseudo-revolt by simply passing troops back and forth to erode loyalty down to one, and then disband the Lord to trigger an instant revolt for you to farm for slaves and experience. Personally, I never find myself needing to exploit this because on the harder difficulties you have revolts galore thanks to your unwilling workforce. But regardless, that's another tool for you to choose to use and if you want to increase loyalty, this can be through Lokia and Kronhellebrorn skills as well as rights and research. 
And lastly on rights, other than the sacrifice to Mathland to increase your black art capacity, if you're feeling uneasy, trigger the sacrifice to Kane to use Dark Conduit, an incredibly powerful, party-friendly explosion which decimates the enemy and is great to keep in clutch for hard expansions or to help kick back against Chaos. Overall, the Dark Elves are an incredibly powerful faction and require correct execution to get the most out of. Mastery of the faction largely relies on utilizing your followers and heroes, maximize your dedicated worker provinces, and you will have enough barbed arrows and spears to finally recapture Ulfwan in the name of Malekith. And that's it for this video, thank you so much for watching. Please consider liking and subscribing for new content every week. This has been Elven Plot Armor, cheers for watching.